Well, hello, Terry. It's, I'm so glad to catch up with you. Um, you're looking well, and and um, I, I so enjoy making music with you, and gee whiz, hasn't been for a few months, and it looks like it might be another couple before we get to do it again, so nice to be able to chat for a minute. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Yeah, I'm looking forward to getting back with uh, Bach in Baltimore, and it's uh, it's been a fair number of years we've been together, Herb. I, I think uh, we started in... Uh, uh, was it 2001? Wow, I was I was a young man in those days. <laughs> uh, so that that's 19. We're in our 20th, 19th or 20th season of making music together. Yes, and uh, lots of concerts. How many would you reckon we've? Because not every single concert has a bassoon, right? No, no. But yeah, when you think of close to well, and and in addition, I also performed with you with the Handel Choir when you were with them. So uh, in all, we've probably done a hundred performances together. Oh, yeah. 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 I'm music director emeritus these days in the Handel Choir, but I, <laughs> I, I left that group. Uh, oh, gee, it was about 10 years ago, I guess now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so um, you, you're a wonderful bassoon player. You teach bassoon at, at Towson University. You have all kinds of um, fabulous, um, students who've done well and you're you're so active I'm, i i want to just say what a pleasure it's been for me to have you play with us that your playing is splendid and we we all really appreciate it and i love working with you too herb and one of my delights this last year or two is to uh, edit and make some videos with you about your pre-concert talks and it's so good to now see those up and uh, so the whole world can view what you've uh, been giving uh, privately to our audiences over the years. Yeah, you know, I studied with Helmut Rilling, and Rilling is, um, well, I for, I for years and years, I said the greatest Bach conductor who ever lived. Uh, he's certainly one of the several greatest ones, and it was a con enormous privilege to study with him uh, over, uh, in the summer times for something like a dozen years. Uh, mm -hmm. Boy, that was a pleasure. And he's the one who got me started on this. Um, you know, I went to, in undergraduate school, of course, I didn't specialize, but even... This was in school, Oregon, wasn't it? In Oregon yeah, he was in the in summer? Oregon yeah. And, and, yeah. and he was from Germany, and he invited me to go to Stuttgart to study some more with wow. him there. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, but um, even in Peabody, th this way to, um, to analyze Bach, where the music and the theology kind of merge into one um, beautiful whole, is something that really you know, put me on that road. Yeah. And having been on it for a while, wow, it just leaps off the page to me now. I just, it's astonishing. It wasn't sort of everyday known, you know, way to think about Bach, but it, it wasn't 50 or 100 years ago, evidently. And they call Bach the, uh, what, the fifth evangelist or the fifth gospel because of his, uh, his uh, extraordinary witness. That's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right. So of all the Bach we've done together, um, I would be quite interested. Do you have any favorite pieces or two that leap well, into your mind? You know, you always love the one you're with at the moment. That often is the case. But I'll, I'll tell you, it's a real delight when we do the St. Matthew Passion. Oh. I just, I love the, the fact you've got two orchestras there. So I get to see more of my colleagues and the antiphonal forces and the masterpiece that it's it is, and occasionally my wife comes and plays with the Bach as Baltimore as well. So it's a sort of a family reunion in music, and uh, it it is a, quite an astonishing work. I, I studied it a little bit as an undergraduate in one of my music history courses, and just fell in love with that and uh, all that goes on in that piece. Well, both of the passions that we have. Um... The, and we, we think, of course, there was a third one that got lost, oh. but the, the St. Mark. But the, the two that we have, the opening choruses, to me, are mind-numbingly beautiful. I, I, mm. And then within them, there are these various arias that I just, you know, they're, they're just weepingly beautiful and powerful. So those, those are good choices. I think in my case, if, I had, if you asked me for a bassoon piece, a piece that featured the bassoon, I would go with the quonium from the B minor mass. Yes. Which is really a trio, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, we always think of it as a horn solo, and it is. It's for the horn and the baritone. Um, 
but with two bassoons yeah. and which play obligato parts, free parts that are essential to the piece. And it is just gorgeous. Mm. I mean, it's very beautiful. The other thing I love in, in Baroque music in general are those wonderful trio moments when you play with the, with say two oboes and ev all the strings drop out and we have that woodwind color um, so often. And I think you're, you're perfect with all, your articulation thinking down there. I always think is right smack on. I always enjoy that. Um, and uh, there's many of those moments too. The bassoon's a great, a great instrument. Well, I love it. Glad you do too. <laughs> so um, in a minute, I'm going to see if you'll play something for us, but I wondered um, if you had anything, um, you, you and I were talking before we came together just now, we were talking for a little bit about the Toctus idea that might unify pieces. Sure. And um, I would love to hear you say a little bit more about, first of all, maybe some people who are listening to us may not quite know what a Toctus is, but um, what you were thinking about that. Yeah, so I've, I've done some study of Baroque music, and uh, there's also been, uh, there's a, a workout by Newman called uh, something on proportional tempos. And it becomes very apparent that many of the Baroque composers viewed multi-movement works as being a single composition, and in, in the way in which they're unified by underlying tempo. And this underlying tempo is called a toctus, uh, from the Latin word uh, meaning meter or tempo. And so you, you particularly see that we've, we've got uh, movements in the Baroque period that are tied together by the fact that one movement ends in a half cadence, which then goes on to the next movement. And the performance I'm offering here with the Telemann Sonata uh, for bassoon in F minor, the third and the fourth movement, the third ends in a half cadence, which then is only resolved in the next movement. So they're, in, they're, they're linked harmonically, and I think they're absolutely linked by tempo. And these tempo means simple tempo, simple relationships, uh, two to one. Uh, occasionally one to three or two to three. But in my performance, I work with that. Now, now it doesn't mean I take out the metronome and it's got to be absolutely precise, but there's, there's this idea of you, you're making a, a reference point to the Toctus. Some movements you push a little faster, some you do a little slower. And I've extended that to the, my performance of the Mozart Bassoon Concerto. I've got videos on that and talking about that as well. You, you know, it's, it's inter interesting to me because uh, two things. Thing one is Bach wrote these 20 minute cantatas and many of them are so-called chorale cantatas, mm. which means that a chorale or what today we would call a hymn tune um, is a per unifying factor from movement to movement to movement. Yes. Now, if it's a six movement cantata, perhaps that tune is available in say four of them or three of them. But um, as I work with these wonderful soloists and instrumentalists, I've been sending out you know, metronome mark with the parts, metronome marks about what I had in mind. And that's how I discovered the Toctus thing. I said, mm. Holy smokes, you know, just what you said, you know, I, I think through this piece and it just wants to go at this piece, at this tempo, and, and it divides into two, bum, 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 bum. And all yes. of a sudden, two minutes, two moments later, there's one and three and it goes, bum, 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 bum. You know, and the basic pulse, the Toctus, as you so correctly said, is roughly the same. And again, you're right, one or one little click up and down the, the metronome yeah. slide. Yeah. But um, that, that's that been fascinating to me. So there's these multiple, and of course, Bach and Telemann lived at the same time, as you know. Um, I, I always, when their names come up together, I always think of the story of, of Leipzig because the, the town fathers, Yes. Um, we're looking for a new cantor, which is a very important job in the city, taught in the school and ran music in three churches. And they offered the job to Telemann and Telemann declined. And so they had to settle. Settle. For Bach. For Bach, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, and of course Bach stayed there in, until uh, for the rest of his days. So I wanted to close out Herb talking about, uh, there's been a discovery in the last few decades of Bach's Bible. Uh -huh. This was the personal Bible that he had in the last decade of his life. Um, prior to that, scholarship 
uh, of Bach, uh, Friedrich Blum, who was an important scholar of that period, they thought that Bach's religious life was actually only tied to the fact that he was employed, that he made money from the church and therefore he didn't obviously have much religious life. I, I don't see how you can think of the Katatas that way. But, but with, I've got sort of a facsimile copy of Bach's Bible, and in it are his devotional marks. Oh, wow. That's He's fabulous. actually, you know, like, this was his private Bible where he himself made marks. And, and the thing that I find particularly touching, and, and let me ask you this question. What would you think Bach's favorite book of the Bible would be the last decade of his life? You know, um, he had so much suffering in his life, losing children and their, and disease and stuff. I'm a little tempted to say Job, but um, it's probably, I'm, I think you may well say the Psalms. I don't know. You're very close. It's Ecclesiastes. Okay. Ecclesiastes, you know, vanity of vanities and reflections on life. It has more margin notes than in, any other book in the Bible. And I find that just fascinating. You know, the other thing about, when you say about Bach, I just don't, I actually heard somebody on National Public Radio saying that Bach was, you know, not religious, and I just oh. wanted to throw an egg at the radio in my yeah. car. But, um, <laughs> you know, I have copies of Bach's letters, uh, not facsimiles, but, you know, printed. And he said, and things like this, uh, he burned his finger one day on his pipe. And he said, if that was painful, how much more painful the fires of hell if I don't mm. live a righteous life? Hmm. That's not the musings of a, a um, you know, of a, a atheist, yes, or, or an agnostic. You know, yes. I think he was profoundly religious. Um, yes, and I think the music is no no other conclusion one can make. So listen, um, I love this idea of you playing a piece for us, and this and Telemann wrote a piece just for the bassoon, right? Yes, he did. So, um, you know. Would you be so kind as to play that for us? Absolutely, and uh, I'm presenting here some other of my colleagues at Towson University. We recorded this last uh, January, and I'm so delighted that you've, you've asked for this recording. Okay, uh, let, me, um, let me thank you in advance and sit back and enjoy listening to it. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Herb.
Thank you.